Well, good morning. That was all right, but we can do better. Good morning. That's much better. I am so glad to get to be with you here today. My name is Matt Proctor. I serve as president of Ozark Christian College. And many of you may know that Carterville Christian Church has been a longtime partner with us at OCC in our mission of training men and women for Christian service. So the first thing I want to do today is just say thank you. We are grateful for that financial support because of your partnership. Thousands have been sent out into the harvest field with the good news of Jesus Christ, and we are grateful for that. Uh, Many of you, most of you will remember May 22nd, 2011, when the tornado hit Joplin. And uh, my family and I live on the north side of town, so fortunately our house was not hit, but we had some friends in the tornado zone. Their house was hit by the tornado. They were okay. But while their house was being rebuilt, they needed a place to stay. So for four months, this other family moved in to live with my family. Now, here's what you need to know. My wife, Katie, and I, we have six children, okay? Um, just wait. And uh, the family that lived in with, uh, moved in to live with us for, for four months, uh, they have nine children, okay? So you're doing the math in your head right now. Yeah, nine plus six. And yes, I had a 1,000 kids living in my house. All right, they were every Everywhere. I, I brought a picture. Can you see the picture on the screen? Um, I think the picture will show up. There you go. Uh, they were just crawling out of, of, of every corner in our house. And in fact, at one point, my daughter Lydia, uh, during this time, my daughter Lydia was talking with some of her little girlfriends, and, and these little girls were talking about what they collect. And uh, one little girl said she collected coins. A little girl said she collected stuffed animals. And uh, somebody turned to Lydia and said, Lydia, what do you collect? And she said, I collect brothers and sisters. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I feel like I'm doing here today. I know some of you, many of you I've never met, but I am glad to collect some new brothers and sisters in Christ today here at Carterville Christian Church. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you grab them and open them to Matthew chapter 9? That's the text we're going to look at together. Matthew chapter 9. The title for this message, Pass the baton. Pass the baton. Andy Stanley said, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. This was several years ago. Uh, My friend Chris Duncan came to preach in chapel at the Bible college where I served. Now, Chris was serving on staff with a church out in Las Vegas. And as he was preaching this sermon in chapel, Chris told the story uh, in his sermon about a guy that he had baptized just the week before there at his church in Las Vegas. And I'm actually going to call this guy. His name was Mike, but we're going to call him Mike the Homeless Guy because Mike was homeless living there on the streets of Las Vegas. Vegas, but as Chris preached the sermon in chapel, he told us about a lady in his church there that we're going to call the Las Vegas Sandwich Lady because her ministry was to go out on the streets of Las Vegas and to hand out sandwiches to the homeless, strike up a conversation, develop a friendship, put in a good word for the Lord. And so as she was handing out sandwiches one day on the streets, met this guy named Mike, about 50 years old, and developed a friendship, began to pray for Mike every day. Eventually, she was able to lead Mike to Christ. And so just the week before coming to preach in our chapel, Chris, my friend, had been able to baptize Mike into Christ. It was a great story. I remember it well. But as I was sitting there in chapel that day, all of a sudden, it hit me like a lightning bolt out of the blue that I knew what my friend Chris Duncan couldn't know. I I knew what Mike, the homeless guy, could never have known, and that was that his story actually started 60 years before in a little town called Gilbert, Arkansas. There was a man living in Gilbert, Arkansas named Walter Goodman. Walter Goodman was a vanilla salesman. Gilbert, Arkansas, population 100. I've been to Gilbert, probably you haven't. And yet, uh, there was a, a young man living there in Gilbert as well. His name was Roy Wheeler. Roy Wheeler was a senior in high school. He was 18 years old, all-star basketball player. Roy Wheeler was actually dating Walter Goodman's daughter because of the witness of the Goodman family, they were able to lead Roy Wheeler to Christ, baptized there at age 18. When Roy graduated from high school, uh, Walter sat down with him and said, Roy, so what are you going to do with your life? Roy Wheeler said, I don't know. Walter Goodman said, well, I'll tell you what I think you ought to do. He said, I think you ought to go enroll at Ozark Bible College, and I think you ought to play basketball for him, and who knows, maybe God will make you a preacher. And Roy Wheeler said, okay. 
And so in the fall of 1950, with a a little bit of financial help from Walter Goodman, Roy Wheeler enrolled at Ozark Bible College. Now, he'd only been going to Ozark for two, three months, and one day he walked into the president's office, President Edwin Strong, and uh, Roy Wheeler said, "Uh, President Strong, I'd, I'd love for you to help me get a preaching ministry, a little church that he could go preach at on the weekends. And President Strong was a little surprised, and he said, oh, well, you're, uh, Roy, you're just a, just a freshman. I'm not really sure that you're, that you're ready for that. In fact, I've been watching these last uh, you know, few months, and it seems to me like all you're interested in is, uh, is basketball and girls. And Roy Wheeler said, oh, no, sir, you're, you're wrong. I'm interested in girls and then basketball. <laughs> and uh, President Strong laughed, and, and he kind of took Roy Wheeler under his arm, began to mentor him, and eventually he did help Roy Wheeler get a ministry. Now, Roy, when he started, didn't know what to do. He said, President and strong. What do I do? I've never been a preacher before. He said, well, you just love people, preach the Bible, and you tell them that Jesus loves all kinds of people. Okay? When Roy Wheeler graduated from Ozark, he went down to a little church in Amarillo, Texas, Paramount Terrace Christian Church, about 180 folks or so. And Roy Wheeler loved people and preached the Bible and told them that Jesus loves all kinds of people. And that church began to grow. Today, today, Paramount Terrace Christian Church down in Amarillo, Texas, runs over 8,000 people. Now, in the 1980s, there was a young man, a teenager, that walked in the doors of Paramount Terrace Christian Church there in Amarillo, Texas. That young man's name was Judd Wilhite. Now, Judd Wilhite, a teenager caught in the throes of an alcohol addiction and a drug addiction. His life was falling apart. He'd hit rock bottom. That's why he walked in the doors of the church. He was met there by some folks who had heard a lot of sermons on how Jesus loves all kinds of people. So they just welcomed this stoner kid in with, with open arms, and they helped him begin to pick up the pieces of his life and answer his questions. In fact, Roy Wheeler took Judd Wilhite underneath his arm and kind of began to, to mentor him. And in fact, eventually he said to Judd, Judd, I, I, think, I think you ought to be a preacher someday. Now today, Judd Wilhite is the preacher of Central Christian Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's been preaching for a long time about how Jesus loves all kinds of people. And today, that church in Vegas runs over 20,000 people. Now, I've known Judd for a long time. One time, Judd told me about a a young man in his congregation named Cody. Now, we're going to actually call him uh, Cody the Fisherman because Cody's job, he was a professional fisherman. That is, until he got caught up in a crack cocaine addiction. He ended up selling his boat, eventually ended up selling his house to pay for the drugs. And Cody ended up homeless, living there on the streets of Las Vegas. In fact, he ended up living uh, at one point in a field across the street from Central Christian Church there in Vegas. Now, Cody would later say that at one point during the season, he had gone over three months without a a bath or a shower of any kind. He said, I smelled so bad. He said, even the other homeless guys didn't want to hang around me. That's pretty bad. And Cody had heard that that church across the street there, Central Christian, they'd give you a hot shower and a hot food, you know, for for anybody that walked in the door. And, And Cody the fisherman didn't want anything to do with God, but he knew that he needed a shower. And so one Sunday morning, Cody walked in the doors of that church. Now, he was met there in the lobby of that church by a lady named Michelle. We're going to call her Michelle the soccer mom because Michelle was just an ordinary soccer mom. She was a volunteer greeter there at the church. And when she saw Cody walk in the door, it wasn't hard to size up the situation. Long beard, dirty clothes, gaunt face. She could smell him from across the lobby. She knew that he was homeless. But Michelle had heard a whole lot of sermons on how Jesus loves all kinds of people. And so so Michelle walked right across the lobby to Cody, and first words out of her mouth, she said, you look like you could use a hug. He was taken aback. He said, oh, ma'am, you you, you don't want to hug me. You don't know. And she didn't pay attention at all. She just wrapped him up with the biggest old bear hug, and and she she said, Jesus loves you, and so do I. And Cody said it was at that moment that God began to soften his heart. Three weeks later, Cody was baptized. Now, fast forward four years. Cody is now sober. He's clean, and he's married. He's got a little small business that he started. He's serving there in the church. When one evening on the news, Cody hears a report. The mayor of Las Vegas had just instituted a new policy, making it illegal to feed homeless people on the street in Las Vegas. Vegas was once voted the meanest city in America to the homeless. 
And the mayor had made it a law. You couldn't hand out food to homeless people anywhere in public. And when Cody heard that, he thought, well, that's, that's not right. Jesus loves all kinds of people. And so Cody, the fisherman, true story, decided to take the mayor of Las Vegas to court to challenge that policy on constitutional grounds. Now, the mayor of Las Vegas was himself a lawyer. So on the day of the proceedings, you can imagine on this side of the courtroom, you had the mayor, you have his entire legal team and their power suits, power ties, briefcases. And on this side of the courtroom is Cody, the fisherman and his one lawyer. Do you know what the lawyer, do you know what the judge said? The judge said, Cody, I think you're right. This is unconstitutional. And she overturned the policy, and it is legal today to feed the homeless on the streets of Las Vegas because of Cody the fisherman. All of which means this. As I sat there in chapel that day listening to my friend Chris Duncan preach that sermon and tell the story of baptizing Mike the homeless guy, I suddenly realized... The reason Mike the homeless guy was baptized into Christ was because of the witness of the Las Vegas sandwich lady. And the only reason it was legal for her to hand out those sandwiches was because of Cody the fisherman, who had become a Christian because of the love of Michelle the soccer mom, who had heard so many sermons from Judd Wilhite on how Jesus loves all kinds of people. Judd, of course, had experienced that love himself at Paramount Terrace Christian Church under the ministry of Roy Wheeler, who was a preacher in the first place because a vanilla salesman back in Gilbert, Arkansas, named Walter Goodman sat him down at age 18 and said, Roy, I think you ought to go to Bible college and maybe God will make you a preacher. Now, Walter Goodman, he had no idea the... the how far the ripples of that one conversation would go, the thousands of lives that would be changed. But do you know what Walter Goodman did know? He knew that your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Now, when I was in high school... I ran track. I was on the 4 by 800 meter relay team. I was the third leg of the 4 by 800 meter relay. If our coach said this to us once, he said it to us a dozen times. He'd say, boys, races are won and lost at the passing of the baton. I knew that no matter how hard I had run my leg of the race, my job was not complete until I had passed that baton to the next runner. There is no success without a successor. Uh, Somebody put it this way. The legacy of each generation is the leadership they leave for the next. Did you catch that? Uh, No matter how impressive your accomplishments might be, your legacy is not complete until you have raised up those in the next generation who will carry on the work after you are gone. Races are won and lost at the passing of the baton. And so in scripture, we see Moses passing the baton to Joshua, and we see Elijah passing the baton to Elisha, and we see Paul passing the baton to Timothy. The legacy of each generation is the leadership they leave for the next. And perhaps one of the most important questions that you can ask yourself in whatever realm of life it is, whether it's in your workplace or in your family or right here in this church, one of the most important questions you can ask is this Who's taking my baton? Am I passing the baton to the next generation? Am I raising someone up after me who will carry on the work? Now, uh, nobody understood the importance of passing the baton better than Jesus. You got your Bibles open there, Matthew chapter 9, there in front of you. And the text we're looking at today is Jesus' appointing of the 12 apostles. And we're going to start reading here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. We're going to read down through Matthew chapter 10, verse 4, Jesus calling the leaders in the next generation. Listen to what it says, Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and and helpless like sheep without a shepherd and and he said to his disciples he said look the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few ask the lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field and then jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to go drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness and and these are the names of the 12 apostles Uh, first simon who is called peter and his brother andrew and James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and uh, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. 
End of text. Now, here's, here's the story. Jesus has been traveling around village to village. He's been preaching, teaching. He's been casting out demons, healing the most powerful ministry that the world has ever seen. But Jesus knows these two things. First thing he knows is this. He won't be here forever. Jesus knows he only has three years until he's going to die and resurrect and go back to heaven. And so if his ministry is going to carry on after him, Jesus knows that he has to raise up those in the next generation who will carry on his ministry. He has to pass the baton. So he calls these 12 young men. Now, scholars tell us that these young men were probably between about the ages of 18 and 24. In other words, they were college-age guys. And he's going to train them to be preachers. So what Jesus is doing in this text, he's starting his own little Bible college. You following me here? And for most of the next three years, that's what Jesus gives his time to, is training these 12 young preachers. Because Jesus knows, number one, he's not going to be here forever. But number two, he knows that 12 is not enough. What does he say? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This is way bigger than you, 12. And so he says, I'm passing the baton to you, but you guys are going to have to pass the baton to those who come after you. Ask the Lord to raise up more workers. Because... That next generation has got to be raised. Pass the baton. Let the relay continue. Let the chain remain unbroken. The legacy of each generation is the leadership of the next. Now, here's what I came to say to you today, Carterville Christian Church. This this is the heart of the message. This is my sermon in a sentence. We, as the church must raise up the next generation of young men and women to be vocational kingdom workers. We must raise up that next generation of young men and women who will use their working lives, their vocational lives, to preach the word and to lead the church and to reach the lost. We must pass the baton to the next generation of vocational Christian ministers. Now, That is what I am giving my life to. I'm a preacher, but for the last 25 plus years, I have been a teacher of preachers in the work there at the Bible College. And I am literally giving my life uh, into that work because I have one very simple but very deep conviction, and it is this. Preaching really matters. Now, you know that to a lot of people, that sentence would sound pretty silly. Preaching, really. <laughs> You've heard the jokes about preaching. I've heard the jokes about preaching. I will tell you a joke about preaching. <laughs> uh, have you heard the one about the preacher, the elder, and the deacon? They went out deer hunting. They're out in the woods, up in the deer stand, and huge buck crosses a clearing. The preacher and the elder both raise their rifles simultaneously. They fire at the exact same time. The buck goes down, but they don't know which one of them shot the deer. Deacon hops out of the deer stand, says, wait right here, brothers. I'll, I'll go over. I'll tell you who shot the deer. He runs across the clearing, bends down, examines, stands back up, and he says, it's the preacher's buck. The preacher shot the deer. The de- uh, elder hollers back. He says, well, well how, how do you know? How, how can you tell? The deacon says, well, I can, I can see right here. The, the bullet went in one ear and right out the other. <laughs> and that's what people think about preaching, and you know that I'm right, all right? Preaching's a joke. It's a punchline. Preaching doesn't make any real difference in the real world. But the Bible paints a different picture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says that in his wisdom, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Did you catch that? God chose the foolishness of preaching to save the world. Huh. Uh, I get to teach preaching classes there at the Bible College, and I tell my students that when they stand up on a Sunday morning and they go to stage, they better keep their eyes open because when they open this book, it has the power to transform lives. Can, can I tell you when I am reminded of this the most? It's when I'm preaching a bad sermon. Now, I know this never happens to Robin or Damien, but sometimes to me, uh, I'll be up on a Sunday morning and I'm preaching along and I can just tell, hey, it's not working today. <laughs> I am not connecting. This one is just not communicating. I, I had a friend when we were in Bible college together. Uh, one Sunday, he went out to go preach at this little bitty church, and, and the, his sermon that morning, he said, was just a clunker. I mean, it was just a, it was a, a belly flop. And, and yet church people are super nice. And so afterwards, as he's standing at the back shaking everybody's hands, you know, they're all saying, oh, nice job, nice job, nice sermon, nice job. One lady said, 
Nice try. <laughs> I have preached my share of nice try sermons, all right? Y'all follow me on this? And on those Sundays, uh, when I can just tell, man, it's just really not working today, on those Sundays, I just kind of want to get done as quick as I can and kind of go home. I'm not going to beat a hasty retreat. You know, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed and, and I'm a little disappointed. And, and so I just want to get out of there as fast as I can. You know, we're just going to sing one verse of that, you know, closing song. And, and I just want to go home. I'll try again next week. But God, in his great celestial sense of humor, will often give me my best response to my worst sermons. Right? Just to, you know, kind of remind me that it's not about me. And so I'm preaching a sermon, and I can just tell, man, this one is not working today. And we're singing that one you know, verse of that closing song, because I want to get out of there as fast as I can. But lo and behold, people are making decisions. I mean, folks are walking on down the aisle. People are giving their lives to Christ. Here's this lady, and she's shaking my hand, and she's saying, oh, you, you have no idea how that touched me. And I'm thinking, you're right. I have no idea how that touched you. All right? And yet, and yet, if I'm honest, I do know how that touched her, as terrible as my words may have been. If I have been faithful to God's word, it is still powerful. The promise of Isaiah chapter 55 is this. God says, my word, which goes out from my mouth, will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. I, I, love, I love what one preacher says. He says that, that on, the, on the front cover of his Bible, he says that he has engraved the letters T N T. Because he says, this book is a stick of dynamite. This book can, can blast old habits. It can explode sinful fixations. It can detonate new devotion. He says, this book can release enough energy to move any mountain and mend any life. And he says, he says if I hear, he says, if I hear one more time, some Christian sigh and say, oh, the, the church just can't compete with Hollywood. He says, I'm going to twist somebody's tongue. It is Hollywood that cannot compete with the Holy Word. Hear me, nothing on earth can compare with the power of God's Word to transform lives. And that's why I tell my preaching students that when they grab their Bible on a Sunday morning and they stand up to preach, oh, oh, physical, physical eyes, they may just see some guy getting ready to monologue for 30 minutes from some dry, dusty, ancient old book. But spiritual eyes, what they would see at that moment are 10,000 angels leaning over the balconies of heaven, holding their breath, wondering what will happen if these, this time these souls really hear. And they would see 10,000 demons glaring up through the gates of hell, licking their lips, hoping, hoping that no one will listen because, listen, all of heaven and all of hell know the air is charged with supernatural possibilities. They know, they know that at that moment, eternity literally hangs in the balance. If that word that is preached is humbly received, those lives will never be the same. Proud spirits will be broken. Wounded hearts will be bound up. Spiritual adrenaline will surge through weary souls. Final, eternal destinies will be forever altered. I am telling you that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save the world. Preaching really matters. All of which means this. We need more preachers. We need more youth ministers. We need more children's ministers. We need more missionaries. We need more church planters. We need more young men and women who will use their working lives to take this word to a lost world. I uh, I brought a quiz with me here this morning. I'm a teacher. It's what I do. It's just four questions, and you'll see the answers. Question number one, let's see how you would have done. Question number one, my son's a preacher in Indiana. In the state of Indiana, there is one Christian church for every 10,000 people. To reach that same ratio in New York City, how many churches would need to be planted? Answer, 2,000. Who will plant those churches? Question two. Of the 6,500 languages in the world, how many of those languages have no portion of Scripture translated? Answer, over 3,000. Wow. Who will translate those Scriptures? Question three. Of the 16,000 people groups, ethnic groups in the world, how many of those people groups are unreached? In other words, less than 2% of them have ever heard the gospel. Answer, 
7,000. Who will reach those people groups? Last question, question four. How many people die without Christ every minute around the world? The answer is 72. Every second as I stand here, there is another soul that is going into a Christless eternity. Who will reach those souls with the good news of Jesus? Hear me. The harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still few. And we are called as the church to raise up that next generation of young men and women who will use their working lives to take the message of Christ to the world. So could I use my last few minutes to do this? Could I give you some practical application on how you as a church can be passing that baton? Three suggestions. I'll frame them as questions. Here's the first question. Will you say something? Will you say something? Because what I want you to notice in our text is that Jesus didn't sit around waiting quietly, just hoping that someone would sign up to carry on his ministry. No, it says that Jesus called them. He summoned them. He issued them an invitation. He spoke to them. Jesus said something. Would you keep your eyes open for young people with kingdom leadership potential? And when you see something, would you say something? Would you, would you plant a little seed thought in their head? Hey, have you ever thought about being a... Um, now, that young person might be an A-plus student in the youth group because God's mission in the world deserves the best and the brightest, the cream of the crop. But maybe they're not an A-plus student. I'm reminded of a time that President George W. Bush was speaking at his alma mater, Yale University. It was at the commencement exercises. President Bush stood up at, at the graduation and he said, to all of you A students graduating with honors, today I say congratulations. And to all of you C minus students today, I say you too could be president of the United States. <laughs> And you know what? You read down through that list of 12 names that Jesus called. They weren't all honor roll students. But what I'm saying is that God has a long track record of using the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, weak things of the world to shame the strong. You look for that kingdom potential wherever, wherever you might find it. And when you see something in that young person, would you say something? D.P. Schaefer was the preacher of a little bitty church, Connettville, Pennsylvania, 80 years old, still preaching every single Sunday. They had a youth Sunday. And as a part of that service, there was a little boy, first grade, who stood up on stage and quoted from memory a long portion of John chapter 14. And afterwards, D.P. Schaefer was so impressed with this young man, that he went up to that little boy and he kind of tussled his hair and he said, young man, he said, that was, that was outstanding. He said, you'd make a good preacher someday. That little boy never forgot those words. That little boy's name was Bob Russell. Bob Russell became a preacher preached at Southeast Christian Church, Louisville, Kentucky, for 40 years, grew that church from 180 to 20,000 people. And D.P. Schaefer knew that your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Will you say something? Question two, will you pay something? Will you pay something? Because if you have your Bible still open there to our text, Matthew chapter 10, after Jesus calls these 12 disciples, uh, he sends them out to preach. And as he sends them out to preach, notice what he says. He says this, do not take along any gold or silver or copper. He's saying, don't take any money with you. Let the people in the villages support you. Why? He says, for the worker is worthy of his support. Now, I'm a Bible college president. You expected me to talk about money, right? Because that's pretty much my job. A fair portion of my job description is, is fundraising. And uh, in fact, somebody said that when a Bible college president dies, the uh, Bible verse that they put on his tombstone is Luke 16, 22. And then the beggar died. This is my life, all right? And, uh, and I have people that will say to me, oh, man, I can never do what you do, you know, going around asking people for money all the time. And to be honest, when I was a kid, it wasn't like I was, you know, thinking, boy, when I grow up, I'd like to be a professional fundraiser. But I know what our mission is at the school. Every single day, our work is that we get to train young men and women to take the gospel to people who need to hear it. And if raising dollars will raise those kind of leaders, I'll ask for money eight days a week. Listen, our military here in the United States, we have the military academy, West Point, to train leaders for our nation's physical battles. And we, as U.S. taxpayers, 
underwrite the education of those West Point cadets because we believe that leadership matters. The church has Bible colleges and seminaries to raise up leaders for the spiritual battles that we face. And it is right for us to underwrite their education because we believe that leadership matters. And you know what I love? What I love is that when you, when you pay something to help raise up a future kingdom leader, the return on that investment, whew, it is huge and it is eternal. Uh, can, I, can I tell you about my, my son, Luke? This is the oldest of our six kids. Um, when Luke was in uh, high school, uh, he graduated from, from Web City. Uh, when Luke was in high school, he was a good kid, uh, but Luke was a squirrely kid. Luke it was kind of an adrenaline junkie. He loves taking risks. Um, he loves pulling pranks. He kind of loves getting in, in trouble. And, uh, and, and this, was, this was my son, Luke. And I can say that when he was in high school, he never got arrested um, but I did get a phone call at 2 o'clock uh, in the morning, one Sunday morning, from the Lamar Jail saying I need to come pick up my son, all right? This is, this is my boy. Uh, for, this was for a prank that, that he had pulled uh, that went a little too far. And, uh, and, and you know, Luke was, uh, I mean, he's a good kid. His faith was real, and he's a natural-born leader. He's a smart kid. He had an academic scholarship his senior year to go to the University of Missouri. But right at the end of his senior year, God kind of got a hold of his life in a whole new way, and he felt called into ministry. And so he ended up giving up that academic scholarship to, to Mizzou and decided that he was going to enroll last second at at Ozark Christian College. And, and listen, Luke, like I said, good kid, but still 100% squirrely. So before he enrolled in classes, um, I sat Luke down. I said, all right, buddy, I'm super glad that you're coming to Ozark, but here's what you need to do. Before classes ever begin, you need to go to the dean of students' office. And you need to go introduce yourself to him and just get to know him because you will end up in his, in his office sometime, prank boy. I know this is true. And it will be good for you to have a pre-existing relationship with him. And so he laughed, ha, 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 and he went and did it. And, uh, and, and in fact, can I, let me explain this, this picture here that you see on the screen. When Luke was a freshman at Ozark, he was in speech class, and he knew he was going to have to do a demonstration speech as part of speech class. So all semester long, Luke had been growing out his hair. And so on his day for demonstration speech, this was his demonstration. He took a pair of hair clippers to class with him. The title of his speech, How to Give Yourself a Mullet. And that is what he did in front of his fellow students. Bzzz, and he gave himself a mullet. Now, he, uh, he'd actually been trying to grow a mustache all semester to go with it, but he couldn't actually do it. And so what you see in the picture there is actually Sharpie marker. I kid you not. That's Sharpie. And... Uh, <laughs> And then, after, after Luke was done with the speech, he thought to himself, you know what, I should go full redneck and retake all my senior pictures. And so, that's what he did. You know, I've got a mullet and a fake mustache. And so, he got his cut-off shirt and his fishing pole, and he went to the hay bales behind our house and retook his senior... We're so proud of this boy. Uh, <laughs> he's a dork, all right? Now, that's the before picture. Can I show you the after picture? This is my son, Luke, today. I think you'll see it there on the screen. Luke, Luke married a wonderful young lady, beautiful young lady there that he met at, at Ozark. Um, by the way, let me tell you how he met her, um, Rebecca. Rebecca was a student assistant in the dean of students' office. <laughs> I kid you not. He was in there so much, they struck up a friendship. He talked her into going out with him, and somehow they got married. And now I have three wonderful grandsons. And, uh, and today, today, my son Luke is a preacher of a church about, about the size of Carterville out in Indianapolis, Indiana. Now, can I tell you, that is why I am grateful for churches like Carterville Christian Church and your support of Ozark. Because when my son enrolled, look at that first picture. He was not ready to be a husband or a father or to preach the word or to lead a church. But at Ozark, there were godly men and women that came around him and they invested in him. And they loved him and mentored him and taught him and challenged him and stretched him. And I, uh, this wasn't too long ago. I got to go out to that church in Indianapolis where my son serves on what they call Baptism Sunday. And I got to hear my son just preach a sermon on, on why baptism is important. And when they offered the invitation... Um, 23 people walked down the aisle to be baptized. And I, I used to think that, that baptizing someone into Jesus was um, the greatest thrill in ministry, and it is an incredible honor. But for me now, the greatest joy in ministry is to see someone that I have raised up, someone that I have taught and invested in, baptize somebody into Jesus. I like the way somebody put it. Somebody said, my fruit grows on other people's trees. 
And what I'm saying is this, that because you supported Ozark, which shaped my son, those 23 baptisms, that's your fruit growing on Luke's tree. In fact, because, because you support a school like Ozark, we, we have 15,000 alumni at Ozark. And if every one of those alumni were, were to reach 1,000 people in their lifetime for Christ, that means that your fruit is actually 15 million lives changed. The investment on a kingdom dollar in a kingdom leader is huge and it is eternal. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Will you pay something? Last question. Will you pray something? Will you pray something? Because that's what Jesus told us to do in the text, right? He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to to raise up, to send out more workers into the harvest field. Do you pray that prayer? Do you pray that Matthew 9, 38 prayer for more harvest workers? Workers, when you walk out today through those doors in the lobby, you'll see uh, a a table with a lot of Ozark literature. Please help yourself to whatever you'd like. But would you especially grab one of these in a basket? You'll see these little keychain tags. On one side, it'll say Ozark. But on the other side, it has Matthew 9.38. And a reminder to pray for more harvest workers. Would you grab one of those? And would you just put that on your keychain or put that on your dresser or put that on your desk or put it by the mirror in your bathroom where you get ready? Will you use that somehow as a prayer reminder every day to pray for harvest workers? Maybe there's a young person by name that you need to be praying for. Can I, can I close with this? Can I just tell you my personal testimony? I grew up knowing that I was supposed to be a preacher. When I was in seventh grade, the ritual every Sunday was the same. My hometown preacher, we called him Brother Bill, had a ritual, a liturgy that he did with me every Sunday in seventh grade. He would get done preaching, he'd stand at the door, shake everybody's hands as they would leave, and when it was my turn to to grab Brother Bill's hand and and shake him on on the way out the door, uh, these were the two questions. This was the, the ritual, the liturgy. Every Sunday, same two questions. This is what he'd say. He'd grab my hand and he'd say, Matt, he'd say, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I'd say, a preacher, because puberty is a killer. And, uh, and he'd say, and where are you going to go to college? And I'd say, those are Christian college. And he'd say, that's my boy. And he'd slap me on the back and he'd send me out the door. And I grew up just knowing that I was supposed to be a preacher. But when I got into high school, I pulled a Jonah. I ran from God's call on my life. I was a very good student in high school. I was a national merit finalist. I got a big academic scholarship to the University of Iowa. I grew up in Iowa. And so my senior year, I, I turned my back on it. I, I, I scrapped all my plans for ministry, scrapped all my plans for Bible college. Instead, I enrolled at the University of Iowa as a journalism major. Some of you will recognize the name Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw went to the University of Iowa. I was going to go be the next Tom Brokaw, make my name, fame, fortune in the world as a journalist. And that year at the U of I was not a good year for me spiritually. I was not living under the lordship of Christ. I was a prodigal son in a far country. But the summer after that first year at the U of I, I I worked a job I had worked before. It was at my my Christian service camp, the church camp that I had grown up going to. I liked working outside, and so I mowed the grass at this camp, and I chopped the wood for the, the campfires, and I would go around all, all the trash cans, pick up all the trash, and, and, and I, I just worked there all, all summer long. And of course, at that church camp every night, they would, they would have chapel services, church services, and during those services every evening, I would usually come in, and, and I'd stand right inside the back door during the worship time because I liked the music. I thought the worship bands were kind of cool. But when the preacher would get up to preach, I would leave. I didn't want to hear it. Didn't want to be convicted, you know. But during the ninth grade week of camp, the preacher for that week was this little guy named Bob Martin. Now, Bob Martin was 5'2", maybe 5'3", on a good day. Just this little bitty guy that you would never think of as a a dynamic youth speaker, never going to stand on stage at CIY and preach to thousands of teenagers. But during that ninth grade week of camp, I'd be standing at the back of the chapel and when Bob Martin would get up to preach, for whatever reason, I couldn't leave. His words just just reached out and grabbed a hold of me. And all week long, the Holy Spirit just started doing this, this blitz on my heart. And I don't know if you've ever been to a week of church camp. If you have, you know 
how they always go. Every week of church camp leads up to the last night. And the last night, it's usually Thursday night, is the super emotional night. And the preacher gets up and he preaches this challenging, convicting sermon. And the band gets up and they play this, you know, super emotional music. And, and every Thursday night of every week of camp, there's always this great big herd of crying junior high girls that come down at the invitation time. And they rededicate their life to Jesus for the 17th time. And you know that I'm right about that. And, and that's how every week of camp goes. And this ninth grade week of camp was absolutely no different. Bob Martin got up that night and he preached a challenging sermon. And when the worship band got up and they played the invitation song, this whole big crowd of crying ninth grade girls came right down here to the front. And standing uh, right there in the middle of them was one college freshman guy. And I had to stand up in front of that camp and just repent that I had been running away from God and it was time for me to get right. And I knew that for me, that meant going to Bible college and being a preacher. And what I did not know at the time, I found this out later, um, what I did not know was that Bob Martin knew my story. He knew that I was a Jonah. Because what I did not know at the time, I found this out later, um, my hometown preacher, Brother Bill, was Bob Martin's (laughs) brother-in-law. And he told on me, he ratted me out. And what I did not know at the time, I found this out later, was that Bob Martin had fasted that entire week. And he had prayed every single day for me by name. And I'm absolutely convinced that the only reason I'm up here talking to you today is because Bob Martin prayed me back into the kingdom and he prayed me right into ministry. Who is it that you need to pray into ministry? Will you say something and will you pay something? But most of all, will you pray something? Because your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Pass the baton. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful. For those who spoke the word to us. And now, Father, we pray that you would use us to raise up the next generation to speak the word to those who come after. Father, I pray that from this very church, Carterville Christian Church, you would send out a tidal wave of workers into the harvest field. I pray that you would raise up a generation of young men and women that you will use for your glory and for the world's good. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.